Welcome to Talking Voiceovers, where we interview professionals of the South African voiceover industry. Today we'll be chatting with Daniela Pellegrini van Royen, a voice artist as well as a lawyer. Welcome, Daniela. Nice to finally meet you. I've been wanting to chat with you ever since when I first started voiceovers. A friend of mine said, hey, I know a friend of mine who does voiceovers. You should chat to her and find out how to get into voiceovers. And I was thinking, nah, I can't do that. <laughs> That's just the wrong way to go about it. You should have phoned. I have so many people that often phone me just to say, you know, how do we get in? What do we do? How do we approach it? So you can phone anytime. I'm always here. <laughs> <laughs> it always just seems like such a big, vague question. How do you get into voiceovers? Well, there's so many things to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It is, it is. And it's one of those funny things that for me personally, it kind of just happened. I didn't even know it was a career, to be honest. I started speech and drama very young and I was a gymnast for many years and through gymnastics that opened up some doors for me to do some TV work at the SABC. They were doing something called, I think it was called Africa. Tales when I was really little, I was maybe five or six, and they got all these gymnasts in to come and dress up in like body suits, and then we would be a, a shadow forming different animal shapes. And I'd totally forgotten that I did voiceovers for this TV show that I was presenting on. And I found a diary the other day which said something along the lines of, oh, I was in the voiceover booth doing voiceovers this week, and it was so much fun. And I was like, huh? I don't even remember that. <laughs> I remember the TV show, not doing the voiceovers. Um, because in my head, my voiceover career really only started I guess while I was uh, studying at Varsity and and training at 5FM and doing some radio stuff where a producer said to me I think you would be great for voiceovers come and let me train you so in my head that's where it started until I found this diary entry where I was like wow I was about 15 doing voiceovers how amazing so you got into voiceovers before being a lawyer long before law is my second career <laughs> Um, I finished up school and I always wanted to be a TV and radio DJ. So I went and I was a gymnast for many years. Um, so when I went to what was RAL back then, now UJ, which is giving away my age, I studied uh, sports communications, which was a hybrid between sports science and journalism, because I wasn't quite sure which way I wanted to go. And then I thought, well, you got to try, otherwise you never know. So I, um, I got onto Rao Radio at the time, and it just so happened that because they were really pushing to get women into the industry, so it meant that there was a lot of opportunity, which I think our predecessors may not have had access to. So that was a wonderful time. Uh, and while we were training to be DJs, uh, one of the producers who had worked there for a long time said to me, I've got lots of voiceover work for you. Let's get you up on voiceover. So I was like, okay, sweet. So I spent many, many, many hours doing radio stuff and reading scripts. And, and actually live reads was a really good way to, to train voiceover skill in trying to sound like you're not reading. Many, many hours in the booth. I used to go to lectures at Rao and then go straight to the SABC. And it's handy that they're like four blocks apart. So <laughs> I could leave and go straight to training. And I used to sit in and watch all of the, the great DJs doing their thing. ENF, I spent a lot of time with watching him and Sasha Martinengo. I, I think because it happened with the timings of lectures, it was great to be able to be there for their afternoon show. So I, I did a lot of voiceover work, training work there. And one of my first voiceovers while I was training at Five was for a radio, I guess an online DJ platform called DJ Online. I did quite a lot of the, the early Roger Good stuff um, for the Saturday surgery, which was pretty fun. So yeah, so it was really a cool time. So there were all these amazing opportunities for women in radio. And so I was very fortunate to be a little bit of right place, right time, right age group, right background, <laughs> little aligning of the stars, which I was super grateful for. And then during my time training at 5FM, I uh, applied for Hot Jocks, which was a 94.7 initiative where they were looking for DJs. And I was a finalist there, myself and Chilo Lemba were, so they looked for a boy and a girl. And shortly after that, after much hustling, I got in, in touch with the guys at SABC One and sent them demos and hounded and hounded and hounded and hounded. And long story short, after many months of hounding, Chilo and I became the voice of Yamampela, which was amazing. So we did promos for SABC for a long time. And let me tell you, that was the most incredible promo training ground. We used to do 56 lineups in an hour which is like one every 30 seconds. <laughs> so basically no fluffs. And from there, I got the nickname One Take Wonder. So normally when I do voiceovers, we go for one and then we go for a safety. Unless there's somebody brand new that I'm working with and they, they want to get to know me and see what my range is and see how I work. So yeah, so SABC was amazing. We did that for a very long time together. And then I moved abroad. I got a radio job in England. So I moved to London. Yeah, it was an expat radio station for South Africans living in London. And I worked there on one of the drive shows. And then the recession happened, which sucked so much. 
So the radio station closed down and I had no choice. I had to go and get a, a corporate job. And I thought, well, if I'm going to get a corporate job, I may as well get good skills that are usable in the voiceover industry after this. And I moved into recruitment and I worked with all the major media companies. So uh, record labels like EMI and Warner Music and Disney as well, which was incredible. And I thought to myself, well, at least if I can leave with a good network and a lot of good sales skills, that's definitely going to put me in a better business development position to be able to keep growing my voiceover career. So I spent six and a half years in London. And then after a miserable economy and miserable weather <laughs> and just deciding it was time, just before I turned 30, I decided to move home. So I came back in 2012, which was amazing and got my voiceover work up and running again in South Africa. What was an amazing time for me in London is although I was working corporate jobs, I got the opportunity. It seemed to be a time when a lot of international channels were launching on DSTV here, and they did a lot of the voice work for the local content from abroad. So I did all the lineups for Animax and Sony, ACT, and Nat Geo Wild and Fox, which was amazing. And then when I moved over here, I kind of got in touch with the people because the, the guys in London said to me, oh no, all of the, the content production and management has moved to South Africa. So I got in touch with the people here and I basically had a seamless transition into Nat Geo Wild, which I'm still doing. So that's amazing. It's been an incredibly beautiful journey. I love the channel. I love the promos. I just love everything about it. It's so much fun. And the way the promos are created, they, they give a lot of room for playing. So that, that's incredible. So that was kind of my first voiceover gig after I moved back from London. And then I started contacting old people that I knew from the industry here. Is that for you the best way to find clients and projects by using your contacts and networking? The early days work that I did, I never had an agent. Then I got an agent. Uh, so even the, the TV presenting stuff that I did uh, in my teens, I never had an agent. That was kind of through networks and contacts. Then when I went to study my first degree and kind of started doing the work at five, I got an agent and had an agent for quite a long time. In the UK, I had a couple of agents as well. People who I still work with or find voices for if they're in need of people for projects. But the one thing I can say consistently for any representation that you have anywhere in the world, you have to self-market as well. So yes, largely, I would say most of my work comes through networking, self-marketing. I haven't for a while, purely because I have a toddler. But before that, I was always quite good at doing things like Christmas style voiceovers or Easter voiceovers or, you know, something linked to a holiday that I could then do characters and accents and kind of send that out to, to people to, to be fresh in their minds. So I'm a huge believer in networking, marketing, and using platforms like LinkedIn. Voice Me is around now as well, so it's good to be there as well. And just connecting with people. And funnily enough, one of the things that's always been very good to me and for me is I'm quite happy to pass on jobs that I'm not able to voice. And you tend to find a lot of that comes back around, especially in South Africa, where we've got such a small industry. So yeah, network as if it was a business. Pretend it's not an art, pretend it's not a craft and go full, full tilt on networking like it's a business. It is a business. Yeah, absolutely. It is a business. 100%. Especially if you're going to make a living out of it, you have to treat it like a business. Exactly right. Exactly right. Sure. So marketing and, you know, having all your demos up to date and just uh, really being comfortable in reaching out to people and connecting with them. Do you do your own demos or do you get them done by a sound engineer? I've had a mix of both in the past. What I found worked really well is uh, the old um, voice bank approach was to do kind of a generic product where you're not representing anyone formally and you would write your own sort of generic scripts and then you could showcase different voice styles. So I use those for a long time, but also over time, as you get good relationships with clients, very often they let you put stuff into your portfolio that you can use as marketing material. So I have a mix of both. I also have stuff that I've done in my home studio, stuff that sound engineers have done for me. So it's just a mix, really. So you have a studio at home. What equipment have you got? I have a very basic studio at home. So in the place that we're in now, I've kind of converted an old storeroom into a storeroom slash studio. <laughs> Most sound engineers would be cringing if they saw, but it's fine. There's lots of blankets and soundproofing and all that kind of thing. I used to like an SM50 mic, which is actually apparently what Bono and U2 use. It's actually a live performance mic, but they often use it in studio as well. Lots of sound engineers say that they, they don't love that mic because they don't find it very warm. It's got quite a lot of noise cancelling outside of your voice. I must say, though, whenever I've used it, people have always been very happy with the work that I've done on there. I also use an Apogee mic, and I'm about to, to upgrade to some road pieces of equipment as well. So, so the, the upgraded studio is in progress. And do you take your studio on the road 
when you go on holiday? So it depends. If I'm going far away, then no. Although having said that, I used to do, especially when I was at uni for the second time doing my law degree, I often had a car studio. <laughs> so people would phone me and say, oh, I need something quickly and desperately. Can you quickly do this? And I'll do it in the car for them. So, so yes, I do. Local travel, I do. But if it's further abroad, not so much now with COVID, but before then I would leave, leave my studio at home. And they were happy with the sound that came from your car. Yes. Yeah. I'll never forget the one time I was away on a, like in a bush weekend at a, a fishing resort and there was zero signal zero you had to drive to the top of one hill to get like one bar of signal and it took forever to send something via we transfer but um i was asked to yodel no i can't sing at all my dad can sing beautifully my niece can sing they're both opera singers and absolutely amazing i cannot sing i i can only talk anyway i was asked to yodel so there i was in the middle of the bush under a duvet yodeling into a microphone and then standing on top of a hill trying to get signal so yes voiceovers do follow me everywhere <laughs> <laughs> so why why did you decide to become a lawyer when you were having so much fun with voiceovers so I still have so much fun with voiceovers it's my absolute passion and if I guess if money were no object and visas were no object I would be living in Hollywood trying to do proper voice acting for animation because I love doing characters and accents and things like that but the main thing that drove me into doing law is especially in South Africa I feel like artist rights are very overlooked if you look at things like the Copyright Act and and you know what sort of protection artists have rave dave from the the kiffness you know he's been having huge problems with collecting his royalties that are owed to him by the south african royalties association i mean he's missed out on and i'm sure not him all of the south african musicians are really having a hard time collecting i know for example he boycotted having any of his music paid on played on the sabc radio stations because sabc was just refusing to pay and I think there's a real misconception that because you're an artist and, oh, it's just quickly, and especially with voiceovers, I'm, I'm not sure if you found this, but, you know, it's the classic thing of, oh, can't you just quickly? And then someone hears your rate and they're like, oh, but why is it so much? You're just talking. Well, if it's just talking, then why don't you do it? You know, and, the, and they often forget that it's a real craft, that it's the equivalent of being a sports person. If you put hours, hundreds of hours into grooming your talent and your art and your passion and your love, especially where there's a, a career and a family to support, you know, you should be paid for those hours because if you were a plumber or an electrician, it would be absolutely no different. So artist rights is very close to my heart and I'm tired of artists being shunned and having no negotiating power when it comes to where their voices are or their, their artwork is being used, how it's being used, how it's being disseminated. You know, the internet adds for a whole extra layer of complexity and, and how things are shared and used and where they go. Not very often because the industry is small, but I've been on the receiving end a few times where, say, a new producer will ask me to do a voiceover and they just never pay and disappear. You know, and what do you do? I've been asked to assist from a legal point of view previously. There were a few actor friends of mine who were cast for a theater production. They went to do rehearsals. They got paid. They got paid. Suddenly they stopped getting paid. And when they tried to all bring a claim against this guy because they'd turned away other work, suddenly his company had folded and gone into liquidation. And it always seems to be that artists are the ones getting the raw end of the stick. And I think as voice artists, we're incredibly lucky because, you know, especially when it was pre-COVID and largely going into studio to do voiceovers, you had some kind of a relationship and a guarantee, sort of guarantee that you were going to get paid for the work you were doing. And often a lot of the same voices are used. So if producers want to use you, they make sure the relationship is in a good space. So normally people are quite good at looking after the voice artists and keeping the industry alive. But yeah, it really gets my goat that so many artists get the raw end of the stick. And the truth is, you know, where do you go for any kind of support? So that's what made me want to go into to law, artist rights and intellectual property rights and making sure that artists are getting paid and that they can feed their families and have a real life and, you know, do all the things that I guess all the professional and trade type of professions give you, but without the stigma of, oh, you're an artist, you know, it'll be fine. Just quickly doodle this for me, or can't you quickly do that, or quickly record this, you know? Yeah, so law was an interesting journey, and, and certainly for me, I think it's very interesting how people's perception of you changes when they realize that you're an artist and an attorney. There, there's a little bit less room for them to feel like they can just say what they want and get away with it, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah don't so, mess with me 
<laughs> do you consult with other artists um, to help them with their contracts and things like that? I have been approached by a few artists and I'm more than happy to always help. I do work, like I said, full time in corporate law. Um, so that's something that I would kind of do on the side. But yeah, if artists need help to look at things, if they're not sure about things, if they're uncomfortable, I'm always happy to have a look and say, you know, this is a risk area or if it was me, I wouldn't sign that or, you know, and, and I guess the difficulty and the disparity with artists and maybe it's a problem the world over, maybe not. And I know we're trying to get an actors union up and, and more powerful here. But I think one of the biggest problems that we face in South Africa is that our industry is incredibly young, you know, and from, from a a content platform perspective, there are quite a lot of monopolies. And, you know, if you want to work, largely you have to accept whatever terms are given to you. So, so very often artists, you know, who do ask for advice will say, well, you know what, I'm just going to accept that anyway, because otherwise I don't work, I don't eat, you know, but at least if I can help give them some insight into what I understand and, and what I can read between the lines, at least they're a little bit more forearmed and they know what they're going into. Um, and I think that's the big thing is it's about education and knowing what you are accepting, what you're not accepting. And if there is a problem later on, where does that leave you? You know, and at least forearmed is forewarned. If you're enjoying this interview, give it a thumbs up. Are there resources online that people can go and, and check out for the laws and all the legal stuff? There are some. Adams and Adams is a great big, uh, it's a very big law firm and they're fantastic on intellectual property. And actually they've released a couple of articles recently about the, the IP issues around the Jerusalem challenge, because although it, it, went, it exploded on YouTube and the whole world started listening to Jerusalem and everyone was doing the dance and posting videos. And it was such an amazing thing from a COVID point of view for unity and to bring hope. And, you know, so many medical professionals around the world got involved and from one point of view, that was absolutely amazing and uplifting at a time when the world was in real turmoil. The flip side is, and this is what the article focuses on and, and speaks about, is how a lot of corporates got people to dress up in all their corporate paraphernalia to do the challenge, and it suddenly became a marketing tool. And now the line between doing something uplifting and community driven versus exploiting an artist and not paying for their work and their intellectual property, that line is now blurred. And the question is, where does that line come into play? So Adams and Adams is a great law firm to go and have a look at uh, some of the resources. And they're quite a lot of smaller law firms. But again, you'll always hear a lawyer say, it depends. <laughs> and that's because it really depends on what your issue is. You know, if it's a contractual law thing, it's, it's a slightly different set of law to if it's an intellectual property law set of problems. So I may not have all the answers, but I'm always happy to point in any direction that I can. <laughs> So where can people reach you if they want to chat to you about that? I must say I'm quite naughty that I'm not as up on social media as I probably should be, but I am on Facebook if anybody needs me. I've got a website at www.daniellapellegrini.com. Then my phone number and my email address is on there as well. So good luck spelling it. <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself when you first started out voice acting? I'm very fortunate that I think because I've always grown up doing drama and arts and public speaking and I ask a billion questions and I've always been talkative and I'm the last of four children so I really understand if you want to be heard you have to speak up and loudly also we're Italian so everything's loud <laughs> but the one thing I would say I often get asked by new voice artists you know what's the trick and the truth is for me there was no trick you've just got to be open to hearing yourself naturally the way you sound and get comfortable with that. That is step one, because if you're uncomfortable with what you sound like in your headphones, you're going to climb a huge, huge mountain. So get used to that first. Then you've got to be comfortable playing. I was going to say playing with yourself, but that sounds dirty. So you've got to be comfortable playing. <laughs> you know, you've got to, once you're used to listening to yourself in your headphones, talk up here, talk down here and make funny noises. And my husband says there is a plethora of wife noises because apparently <laughs> I make like sounds and do things all the time. <laughs> so, so just play around and listen to yourself. And one of the most amazing pieces of advice that I was given when I was training at 5FM was literally repeat everything, everything you hear. The lift, the escalator, the airport, the radio ad, the telephone on hold, they repeat, 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 repeat. And the point is not to imitate, it's to get a feel of your own instruments and your own vocal equipment to find out where your skills lie, where your sounds lie, what sounds good, what isn't, you know, what you're not comfortable with, and starting to get a real feel of your apparatus, because although... A lot of people say that voice is, you know, it's esoteric and it's art. Yes, it is. But also it's mechanical. 
you have muscles, you have tendons, you have a tongue, you have all of this apparatus, teeth, lips, and all of those things completely make for different sounds, accents, pace, pitch, tone, all of those types of things. And you need to get really comfortable with working with all of that. So play all the time. I still do it in the car now. I'll hear someone's voiceover and repeat it. <laughs> My husband will look at me like, yes, Daniela, we've heard that 5,000 times. I'm like, shh, <laughs> and then I'll do it again. <laughs> So play around, play, play, play. And just remember, it, it's like a sport. It's like writing. It's like cooking. The more you do it, the more you mess around, the more mistakes you make, the better you're going to get at it. And the most important thing is to sound relaxed and sound like you're not reading. And the only way you can do that is practice, 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 and listen to yourself. Do you think you need a coach to help to teach you that? Or can you teach yourself? It's a very good question. I think it largely depends on the coach. I think a good coach will help you identify in your own voice what you should work on or you know I guess I've never formally hired a coach but because I had a producer who produced radio spots and they worked with me a lot they were actually coaching me my biggest problem in the beginning is I would read 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 and everything was lovely and pasty and had fullness and whatever and then I get to the end of the sentence and it would kind of disappear and he used to say to me you need to read past the full stop because the last word in the sentence is as important as the first word in the sentence. And if you trail off towards the end, the whole thing is ruined because what's the point? People don't get the message at the end. So I definitely think a voice coach is worth it. I think it's important to try a few voice coaches to find out who actually works for you because maybe your style of taking direction or understanding the language that they're using and associating that with your apparatus might take a little bit of trial and error. But when you find someone that you can relate to, absolutely stick with them. And then I think it's about the in-between moments where once you've really absorbed and understood what they're explaining to you, it's about playing on your own and listening for yourself and coaching yourself as you go through as well. So it's, it's a mix of both. I think there's a real need in South Africa for voice directors to be much, much stronger. I've sat in so many voiceover sessions where people give direction, but they use a lot of words that don't mean anything. And they know what they want, but they can't quite grasp the right language to get you to activate your apparatus in the way that delivers what they need. So I would say that, you know, especially young voice directors who are not used to coaching voiceovers, it would be such a great thing to work with new voiceovers, old voiceovers, experienced voiceovers, because the more people work together, the more you can start to identify what people want to need. And actually what that does is just saves everybody time and money. You know, because if you can go and do two takes and leave, the producer's not wasting time, the voice artist's not wasting time, the engineer can get on, client is happy. So I do think a voice coach is a good thing, but you've got to shop around to find the, the right person for you. And that might also be looking overseas. I know a few voice coaches here and they're fantastic, but really what, I, what opened me up to voice coaches and accent coaches in particular the most was when I was living in London. You just have a whole phone book of them to choose from. <laughs> I was really fortunate in London. I managed to somehow stumble across a guy by the name of Andrew Jack, who's a wonderful man. Um, and he has done accent coaching and voice coaching and all kinds of things on a plethora of Hollywood movies. He coached Elvish on Lord of the Rings. So he is properly amazing and he's very accessible and he's the nicest human being ever. I don't know if he does online stuff. I haven't worked with him in quite a while, but you know, somebody like him is just totally invaluable to get any type of direction from. Another great person is a lady by the name of Mel Churcher. She grew up, um, in Malawi, if I'm not mistaken. And she's also done huge amounts of voice coaching, voice work, and she's also based in, in England. And I believe she does online voice coaching as well. She's wonderful, lovely. She's actually written a lot of screen acting books if people are interested in acting. What is your favorite part of being a voice actor? Ooh, that's a tough question. So all of it, but that's cliche. So different things. I really enjoy being able to understand a script and to be able to deliver quite quickly what people want. So being able to analyze it and understand what fits the brand and, and the script. I absolutely love doing character work. That's my best. I did an advert for Steel, uh, a radio ad for Steel uh, gardening products a few years ago, and I was allowed to do it all in German. And that was just honestly a laugh a minute. I laughed the whole way through. I didn't even know how I got the voiceover out, but that was so much fun. And I guess just being able to express myself. I've always been a performer in one form or another. I've done acting work, I've done TV, I've done radio, but there's something magical about voice where nobody can see what you look like. And yet you have to be able to convey a message or a tone or a feeling and yeah that for me is just magic completely off topic <laughs> do you find that after eating a meal your voice changes it depends on the meal so certainly 
if it's something creamy or buttery, definitely. It's almost mm. like it coats. And if I'm sick or have nasally stuff, that's the death, oh, yeah. death of the voice. That sounds weird. <laughs> Although a little trick that helps me for short voiceovers, you can't do it, well, I can't do it for long sessions. If you buy the original menthol Fisherman's Friends, yeah. and you break one in half and you stick it like up here in your gum, it kind yeah. of opens up your whole sinus cavity and you still don't sound like you, but you don't sound like as congested and blocked as normal. So oh, okay. that was one thing I learned when I had pneumonia and had to do voiceovers. And I was like, how the hell am I going to do this? <laughs> well, thank you, Daniela. That was really interesting. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for having me on board and having this chat. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for providing this amazing platform to chat to voice artists, to share the love. Like I posted on the voiceover group the other day, OVO, 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 which is hugs and kisses in voiceover. <laughs> um, but it's just such an amazing opportunity to help newbies who want to learn and to be able to share knowledge with other experienced professionals. So thank you so much for upping the industry, endorsing the voice artists and just sharing the love. It's really amazing. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Cool. Thank you. And if you need anything, just holler. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Voiceovers. If you don't want to miss the next one, hit that bell button and subscribe to the channel so you get notified of all the upcoming episodes. Cheers. See you next time. Mm -hmm.